I've never really listened to Bon Iver. Only the duet uh, with Taylor Swift that I've listened to 1,247 times. <laughs> oh, the girl it's dad. It's a good song. It's funny. My daughter, who's nine, was asking if she could come to the DNC with me in case Taylor Swift. <laughs> in case Tay-Tay shows oh up. God, that's, <laughs> if only she could vote. <laughs> Are we reconsider the J.D. Vance proposal? Give her the vote. From New York Times Opinion, I'm Michelle Cottle. And I'm Ross Douthat. And this is Matter of Opinion. Well, it is vacation season around these parts. I myself just got back from some glorious together time with my family. It was our first serious trip since before the pandemic, and we spent it several time zones away from the political insanity of the past couple of weeks, which I was kind of sad to miss, but also not at all. But now, with our co-host away this week, Ross, I am thrilled we are being joined by our brilliant colleague, opinion columnist, Michelle Goldberg. Michelle was out on the trail with Harris just last week and wrote a fantastic piece about the Kamala... Kam- the the Kamala, Kamala nominon. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the Kamala nominon. Well, you know, it's a Chapel Roan reference. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm hopelessly out of touch. But regardless, Michelle, welcome. We are so very happy that you are here. We are indeed, Michelle. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I actually think it helps Ross's baby-addled brain when he only has to remember one name. That's so. right. Only one. Only one name. <laughs> I can't. I can't remember. I. I only have two male children, and I am already calling them by each other's name consistently. So this is actually the perfect setting. You know, I once went out on a date with a Frenchman named Michel. <laughs> okay, next time we'll bring him in. <laughs> All right, on to the big news of the week, which is Veep picks a Veep. Vice President Kamala Harris picked Minnesota Governor Tim Walls as her running mate. So guys, how did we get here? Ross? Yeah, I mean, I predicted that she would pick Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, for sort of a mixture of the boring ideological reasons and the boring electoral college map reasons. He seemed like the potential VP pick with a kind of proven track record of generating high approval ratings in a purple state with a lot of conservative voters. And also, Pennsylvania is a must-win state probably for the Democrats to the extent that we can say that vice presidential picks do anything, it seems most likely that it makes some marginal difference in their home states if they're popular. I think now that the pick has been made and we've sort of watched the ticket on the stump and watched the way it's been responded to on social media, I think the pick makes a lot of sense for what the Harris campaign has been doing really successfully for the last few weeks, which is basically try to counteract Donald Trump's advantage with a just a really strong, I'm sorry to use the term, it's overused, but a really strong vibes-based <laughs> campaign, right? Where the idea is you want the guy who sort of made himself a star and a contender to be VP by going on TV and calling J.D. Vance and Donald Trump weird and blowing up progressive Twitter and getting people really excited and being, you know, a guy who seems to know his way around a cable news hit and who's good in front of a crowd. And that's sort of a different kind of bet than a kind of ideological electoral college map calculation. But it's a bet that so far has carried the Harris campaign into a lead in some national polls. The crowds are big, the energy is great, and maybe the way to beat Donald Trump is to have, you know, a politician who can go out and stand in front of a cheering rally and make a joke about how his opponent has sex with a couch. Maybe that's what the Democrats have been missing all this time. I'm not being insincere, right? That could be it. The pick is of a piece with what we've sort of seen from both the Harris campaign and the kind of media pop culture sort of ferment around the Harris campaign since Biden dropped out of the race. I mean, I'm a huge Walls fan, and I was worried, you know, I listen a lot to Sarah Longwell, who now mm-hmm. runs Republican voters against Trump and does a ton of focus groups, and so I think is in touch with a side of the electorate 
that a lot of other people miss. She was very, very bullish on Shapiro because Shapiro really appealed to the kind of people that she's talking to, which are kind of either never Trump or, you know, soft Trump supporters. At the same time, I do think that Shapiro could have been like an Acela corridor idea of what a moderate is. You know, you would have had sort of two fairly slick, super educated lawyers on the ticket. And I'm not sure how much that would have read as ideological balance to parts of the country. At the same time, I do worry a little bit that Democrats are leaning too much on style with Walls. You know, I've heard people say that Walls is a liberal's idea of what a red state voter likes. It's difficult for me to judge from Brooklyn, New York. And I've talked to at least one Democratic operative in Wisconsin who was kind of over the moon about Walls in terms of his ability to reach the voters that they need to turn out in Wisconsin. But I do think that, you know, on the one hand, yes, there is something very relatable about Walls and hopefully he can help them lose by less in rural parts of the country, which is what Democrats need to do. I also think that there is a danger of leaning so much on his persona that it veers into into shtick. And so I don't really I actually don't want to hear the couch joke again. I think that they should leave the couch joke to the Internet, let the Internet do its thing and sort of, you know, maybe even scale back the weird stuff. Let that kind of linger in the background. You know, it makes me a little bit nervous if the. Harris campaign is taking too many cues from the Internet. Let's just pause because listeners may not understand the couch comments. The couch comments are that someone on the Internet made up an excerpt from Hillbilly Elegy in which in the made up excerpt, Vance had got jiggy with his sofa. Exactly. And this has become maybe one of the dominant progressive memes about his candidacy. So. I'm a huge fan of vibe politics. I I do think there's a lot to be said about them. What I think fascinates me is it seems like there is an interesting experiment going on here where the progressive politics of the guy who the Republicans obviously are going to pile on with this. He's too liberal, San Francisco style. Just don't mesh with the persona. It's just like the man snuggles piglets, wears camo, you know, goes to the state fair and wears ratty T-shirts and, like, has a better hunting record than anybody on the Republican side. And I am fascinated to see how this pans out. Like, because pointy-headed folks like us spend a lot of time parsing policy, parsing political background, you know, details along those like that's that's never been what voters seem to be most interested in. They have like an interest in like relatability, what these guys seem to telegraph, whether or not they seem authentic. I hate that term, but that is how this rolls. For me, this is a little bit like what happened with the John Fetterman Senate election in Pennsylvania, where you had a guy who was more liberal than some of his competitors, but came across as kind of like a red state biker. And people really dug that. So, like, this is a different kind of kind of middle America dorky dad vibe that we've got going on here. And I think it will help deflect some of the kind of just basic Republican pylon to liberal message. So, yeah, I mean, I'm having, you know, made the case that this pick makes sense in vibes terms. I, too, am historically a skeptic of what Michelle Cottle just elaborated, right? The idea that voters just are basing their picks on relatability and who they want to have a beer with or hunting with. Not just, right. But, like, if you look at the Democratic politicians who have tended to do well In rural America, you know, whether it's someone like Jared Golden, the congressman in Maine, or, you know, every liberal's favorite senator, Joe Manchin, or even like someone like Mary Peltola in Alaska, they usually both have a sort of, you know, rural friendly persona and a bunch of pretty heterodox positions that put them to the right of the mainstream Democratic Party. And with Walsh, what you see is when he represented a rural area, he was a bit more like that. And then when he became governor, 
I don't think you would say like he's a doctrinaire progressive, but he became governor in a progressive leaning state with a narrow liberal majority that passed a lot of quite liberal legislation. And he happily and eagerly signed it all. And at that point, if you then look at his numbers in the last gubernatorial race, he won the state pretty easily, but he certainly didn't overperform in rural areas. He had a pretty conventional sort of urban to suburban liberal coalition. So I think we're we're pretty short right now on evidence that just nominating the guy who seems country is the ticket to overperformance. But I'm also open to the possibility that I'm, you know, I'm mistaken, right? Yeah, I don't think that he necessarily overperforms among conservative voters strictly defined. But there's another kind of voter. And I, again, these are all small groups of people and kind of how campaign strategists slice and dice the electorate. Right. I don't know. But there there was such a thing as a Bernie to Trump voter. And he seems to me to be sort of very well positioned to appeal to that kind of voter, the person who finds traditional politicians alienating. Well, I grew up as you know, in red state America. And I got friends from high school who are like, why can't Democrats just sound like normal people, for God's sake? Why do they always sound like they've just come from a kind of film studies lecture at Dartmouth? So if you're looking at a very blue state top of the ticket, you know, you've got like a biracial woman who's like California all the way. If you want to talk about balancing style, then he does serve a certain purpose. It was interesting that people who thought that Josh Shapiro would balance Harris. I was a little bit worried that the kind of voters you're talking about that, you know, kind of culturally feel very alienated from Harris would be reassured by a kind of like an overachieving Jewish lawyer, law school graduate. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, again, I think that there's a certain kind of voter who feels reassured on policy, but there are also, you know, if you're sort of alienated from the Democratic Party because it seems increasingly like the party of the highly educated and affluent, then Josh Shapiro doesn't do much for you. Right. Although he has, you know, he has really strong approval ratings in Pennsylvania, which include presumably voters who voted for Trump last time, right? You don't get to 60 percent approval if you're just being approved of by by Biden voters. And I think we should say something briefly about the issues around around Israel, Palestine and sort of the Democrats complicated dance, right? Because there is clearly some calculation here about the risks of losing, on the one hand, sort of both younger left-wing voters and Arab American voters, as opposed to the risks of losing some Jewish voters, right? And, you know, no Democrat would come out and say it, but certainly there are Democrats who are thinking that Shapiro wasn't picked, not even because of his specific positioning, but because as someone who has that positioning and is Jewish, he would be sort of doubly alienated. No, it's not as someone. No, 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 no. It is not as someone who has that positioning and is Jewish. It is someone who has leaned into that positioning in a way that no other candidate has, right? No Democrat is going to wring their hands if the pick was J.B. Pritzker, right? It is not because he's Jewish. I mean, you know, we the New York Times did a big story about at a time when Democrats are torn over Israel and Palestine, here's Shapiro leaning really hard into criticism of the protesters, right? And we can sort of parse what he meant when he made the KKK comparison to some of the tent encampments. And frankly, as somebody who is to the left of the kind of mainstream Democratic position on Israel and would like to see an administration get much tougher on Israel— I thought that Shapiro would be extremely useful there as, you know, sort of a shield if Kamala Harris, President Kamala Harris, um, God willing, wanted to crack down on a Netanyahu administration if Netanyahu is still in power. I think it was a mistake for people on the left to assume that the choice of Shapiro would have signaled a kind of much different approach in a potential Harris administration to Israel. But on the other hand, I just I think that to say that 
the opposition to him was based on the fact that he was Jewish is just a, a slur. But this discussion right here is what the Democrats didn't right, want to have. have. And right. it's what I so didn't like, want to have. I mean, it's taking what's taking a step back. I don't think we want to look at this as though Walls was picked because he wasn't problematic in this way. Everybody's problematic in some way. So, like, talk to me about kind of what does Walls proactively bring to the table, if anything, in policy terms or if we're just talking about vibes. So, like, kind of what do you see as his value added here? Michelle, lead us off here. Well, in I mean, in governing terms, it's that he did in Minnesota a lot of the things that Kamala Harris wants to do nationally, right? I mean, Kamala Harris, she still hasn't fleshed out, I think, a really, you know, robust set of policy positions, but in as much as she is... <laughs> in the two weeks she's had, damn It's a very her. kind, kind damn way of her. putting it. Right. But in as much as we see her kind of message evolving on the stump, you know, she's very focused on cost of living, middle class economics. And if you look at a lot of the things that Walls has done in... Minnesota, you know, things like free college for people who make under $80,000 a year, you know, free school lunches, paid family leave, um, even things that he's done that are like a little bit more heterodox, but don't get talked about that way, like permitting reform and building more housing to drive down the cost of housing. You know, those are the things that she wants to do on a national scale. No, I mean, he did a lot of progressive things, and some progressive things are sort of favorable to the middle class. And those things are things that the Harris campaign wants to talk about to the extent that it wants to talk about policy at all. I mean, I think we clearly are going to be talking about some potentially unpopular things that he supported as a progressive. And we're going to be talking about the debate that's already bubbled up about the public comments he's given that seem to imply that he had seen service in a war zone. Oh, that no, come on, Ross. That is like, I'm sorry, but we're seeing this attempt to swift boat him. And it's worth noting that Donald Trump's campaign manager was the architect of the swift boating of John Kerry. But it just seems to me that it is in such wildly bad faith. I mean, the quotes that they're finding, he says, basically, he's talking about weapons that shouldn't be available for purchase by people who, you know, say want to shoot up their schools. And Mm -hmm. he says something like, these are weapons of war, weapons I carried in war. And that was— Did he carry them in war? Well, he carried them while deployed as an artillery man in operation during freedom, but in not in a war zone. In what right, country? In he has never claimed to be— Should he have said that? Taking one step back, the difference here is John Kerry was picked and ran on his whole reporting for duty, I'll be a tough commander-in-chief, one— We're not talking about the top of the ticket, because if you want to talk about the top of the ticket, then Captain Bone Spurs is going to have to be dealt with as well on the Republican side. And two, he is not running as a military vet primarily. He's running as a former high school teacher and even more importantly, state champion winning football coach. So I'm just saying there are differences. Ross, can I ask you a question? I think that a lot of people thought that his biggest vulnerability was going to be the riots after George Floyd's murder. Um, Having heard the recording in which Donald Trump talks about how wonderfully he handled those riots (laughs) and and how much strength he showed, uh, do you think that there is some deflation among conservatives? I don't know if there's I, I haven't been like on the phone with conservative strategists, so I, I couldn't tell you if there's specific deflation. I think that that helps him, obviously. The thing that immediately struck me about the pick was that you were picking a figure who was associated with sort of what you might call peak 2020, right? Which, from my perspective, looking back, was sort of the period of maximal liberal craziness in my own life. And here was the guy who was literally governor of Minnesota when the George Floyd protests started. But certainly it helps him in that debate and discussion, since he was criticized for how he handled the riots, to have Donald Trump praising him. I I don't think there's any question about that. Oh, yeah. I think he dodged a big issue here because they were gearing up to make that fit into the broader narrative of Democrats as soft on crime. 
I don't think that narrative goes away. And uh, the story of sort of public safety in Minneapolis thereafter for a while was not really a pretty story. So I, I, I certainly think there are still legitimate criticisms of his record on those issues. But does it help him to have that tape? Yes, absolutely. Oh, sure. We're talking about degrees yeah. with all of this. Nothing, no attack is going away. It's like, that's not how that works. But it does keep it from being so central. Okay. So with that, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how Harris Wall's ticket stacks up against the dynamic duo on the other side of the ballot. So stay right there. So we've officially got both sides of the ballot filled in now. It's Trump fans versus Harris Walls. We kind of know the basic shape of things. So if you're looking at these pairings, give us, I I mean, maybe just a bumper sticker sense of what their priorities are and kind of where they stand. I think that, you know, the sort of top line vibes based take is that this is joy and the future versus anger and the past. Ross? I would say that the Democratic ticket wants it to be coolness versus weirdness. And the Republican message when it was Joe Biden was strength and economic success versus inflation, old age, and weakness. And I don't think the Vance pick was made particularly with those narratives In mind, I think the assumption was those narratives were sort of set already, and the VP pick wasn't that important to it. I don't think the Trump-Vance campaign has sort of settled on their ideal frame. They're sort of moving back and forth between casting Harris and now Walsh as sort of chameleons versus just casting them as as sort of far left and, and progressive. I do think there's certainly a big risk for the Republicans, that they're just sort of defined as doom and darkness, which sometimes plays, I mean, plays better in American politics today, maybe than it used to. I don't think you can just say, ah, the campaign of, you know, things are bad is going to lose. But that is sort of where they are. I mean, I think that you're right. And I wrote about this in 2016, that, you know, I was very worried about the Hillary Clinton message of like, America is already great, because... Even then, I think the vibes were kind of dark, and Donald Trump was tapping into that. But don't you think people are just exhausted? I mean, it's been eight years of American carnage. Like, you don't think that there's a part of the country that just finds joy like a really refreshing change? Well, I think the pitch that Trump had going for him in this election and the reason that he was ahead in the polls was not the American carnage pitch. It was basically the pitch that America was better off and the world was more stable and safer in 2019 than it is in 2023 and 2024, right? So when Harris now has her line, you know, we're not going to go back, right, which is casting Trump as reactionary and herself as forward-looking, I think it's been a strength of the Trump campaign to date that some people want to go back, not to, you know, 1957 or something, but to the low inflation economy of 2019 and a world where we hadn't had the disastrous pullout from Afghanistan, the invasion of Ukraine, and crises in the Middle East. So there's, I I think what Harris is trying to do is to basically make Trump into the reactionary choice. And what Trump had done to date was make himself into a, you know, candidate of nostalgia for the very, very recent past. So to the extent that the Trump-Vance campaign gets stuck back in American carnage, everything is just terrible all the time, I I think that's a a bad place for them to be. I think they need the vibe of Trump did a good job last time, he'll do a good job again, America can be great, things aren't that bad, you just have to put Trump back in power. That's what they need. So I do find it fascinating to see what they're going to do. Obviously, they're scrambling because they had spent years building kind of framework to go up against a guy who was older than they were and who seemed weaker than their guy. And then suddenly, 
all of that has been upended. And what we have now is Trump is old. He has slipped. He is not sharp. He is once again dark. And there's really no kind of other way to look at it than he and Vance or the reactionary choice. I think if he had known what was happening, there is no way he would have picked Vance. He would have picked somebody who wasn't giving the middle finger to everybody but his kind of MAGA populist base. And they don't really have much else to offer as a message. Now, that does not mean that he won't win. It just means that they are having to scramble to find their footing because they don't know how to fight against a different sort of ticket. And it's been interesting over the last week. I mean, this might radically change by the time people are listening to this. <laughs> it's true. But over the last week, it seemed like it's almost seemed like a Vance Harris race because Vance is the one out there on the trail following Harris around to all these swing states. You know, Trump has done like one rally in the last week. And so Vance at the moment is really the public face of the campaign. We should say we're recording this Thursday morning. Trump has announced he's giving a press conference at 2 p.m. this afternoon, right? I mean, Trump is not going to disappear, obviously. No, but generally speaking, if he's not going to be out there as the front man for this campaign, then, you know, you're left with J.D. Vance, who, again, let's speak to this, has come across a little weird, this race. And I, you know, like, as you know, Ross, I'm, I'm not a J.D. hater. I've sat down with him. I think he's more earnest and certainly whip smart and uh, kind of thoughtful. But he has not covered himself in glory on the trail so far, whether you're talking about, you know, how he has responded to these old quotes where he seems to be completely dissing childless folks or even, you know, making snarky remarks about people who did not biologically bear their children, which I think is one of the stupidest moves on the planet. But also, like, when he does weird things, like the other day he tried to storm Air Force Two because it was on the tarmac and he wanted to confront the vice president. And so he had like this, you know, whole pack of guys headed toward the vice president's plane and and she's not there. It's just like he needs to kind of regroup. For somebody who hasn't done this a lot, he needs a little bit more, uh, I don't know, direction than he seems to be getting. It just makes him look weird. I mean, I, I don't I don't actually really agree that he's I think if you look if you just took his convention speech and campaign persona and separated it from the, you know, podcast clips and Tucker Carlson clips but you that can't have do been that. You just you Right. Can't. But no, I'm I'm just I'm just saying I don't think he's been weird, capital W or not. Oh, I thought it was weird. I mean, it was weird when someone threw like such a softball question of like what makes you happy? And I can't remember what the answer was, but it was something like not having to answer dumb questions from journalists or something like that. I don't think it is capital W weird to go, you know, wh whether that was a smart answer or not to, like, go after the press. I think, look, there isn't some sort of magical campaign strategy he can take right now that deals with the fact that he spent several years being a right wing podcast and cable news guest guy. And that is the problem. Right. That he has a trail of comments that you wouldn't make if you were, you know, a cautious, normal politician ascending the ladder. It's the kind of comments that you make if you're going on, you know, I mean, he, he, the, the list of podcasts that he went on in that phase is a list that I am familiar with as someone <laughs> who's familiar with conservatism. Right. But it's just not the normal but, but the normal circuit. But J.D. Vance, A, gives us a chance to kind of marvel at how far we've fallen all over again. And also, he doesn't have the, you know, sort of dark, psychotic charisma that Donald Trump has. I mean, we talked earlier about Kamala Harris and Tim Walls as chameleons, right? J.D. Vance is someone, J.D. Vance has only been J.D. Vance for 10 years, right? He's changed his name a bunch of times. Um, some of that was because of his unstable childhood. Some of that, though, was because of his shifting identity as an adult. He's had wildly changing political orientations. He's had wildly changing personas as an adult. And I almost feel bad for him because there's almost a sense in which he's being kind of bullied on the national stage, in which he gives off this deep insecurity that people are latching onto. I mean, it's why these 
couch comments, which, again, I think that people should leave them to the Internet and the Democratic elected should stay away from them. It's embarrassing, especially since there are plenty of legitimate grounds to attack J.D. Vance, no, right? I mean, I think it's embarrassing for, again, for elected Democrats. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think most people know that this is not true. It's I mean, I'm just going to cite I'm just going to cite like the distinguished Atlantic journalist McKay Coppins, who wrote a tweet the other day about how he has a bunch of what he described as intelligent, normal friends who are totally convinced that this story is true. So I think, no, I think clearly lots of people on the left have actually memed themselves into believing that this is a true story. OK, that's unfortunate. It's not. I think what we have learned from politics in the last few years is that a certain segment of people will believe whatever they want. But does any of it matter? Fundamentally, at the end of the day, we are talking about VP picks. Ultimately, it's Kamala versus Trump. Isn't the consensus that sort of VP picks can not particularly help, but that they can harm? I mean, I don't know what the political science says about... Sarah Palin's effect on the John McCain campaign. But people connected with that campaign certainly believe that she was, you know, maybe they're just scapegoating her. Bunch of political geniuses who ran that campaign, let me tell you. Well, yeah, because they picked her. But there's a widespread belief that she was part of his defeat. And, there, you know, people have talked about that Mike Pence helped Trump you know, reassure the Christian conservatives. Dick Cheney was there to shore up George W. Bush's kind of gravitas. So people talk about these things. As you are alluding to, the research suggests that they don't make much of a difference, except maybe on the margins. But on the margins is where we're playing this election. Well, and I think, as we've been saying, it matters that Trump himself has somewhat disappeared, right? And if he's not out there, then his VP can't but play a sort of outsized role. Now, I also think, you know, I don't feel sorry for J.D. Vance. He might be vice president of the United States, and he's going to get to debate Waltz on a national stage, and that will matter a great deal to how he's perceived. But overall, I do agree that we don't know yet enough about how Waltz will play. I do agree that if you were rerunning the tape and Trump was trailing by three points to Kamala Harris, I think he would be less likely to have picked Vance. I think that is that is definitely the case. Um, but let me let me just say one more thing, which is that we have these polls now, right? We have a week's worth of polls showing Harris ahead. And part of what you see in those polls is just incredible levels of enthusiasm from Democrats. The evidence is more ambiguous. Some polls show her gaining with independence. Some don't, right? So I think what we can say about the harris waltz ticket so far is that it is a Democrat maximizer. This is like maximum Democratic Party right now. And what remains to be seen is whether that just continues, but also whether like that is the better strategy than the kind of like cobble together a coalition with more independence. Um, but maximum Democratic Party is where this ticket is at right now with this pick. All right, Ross, I'm going to have to give you the last word on this. As much as that pains me. As I intended by going on too oh, long. Oh, my God. Well, we got, what, 12 more weeks? I mean, at this rate, we could still have, like, an alien invasion October surprise. Don't you feel like if we had an alien invasion, it would be on, like, page four? Right. It, it, we wouldn't even rank at this point. <laughs> and haven't we already had an alien invasion and it was on page four? Ross, Ross, that is enough excitement for today. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get hot or cold. Alrighty, Michelle, it is time for that magical moment when one of us rants about something we're hot or cold on, and we love to offer this tiny hill to die on to our guests. So, do you got anything you're feeling hot or cold about? So, I am going to say I'm feeling hot on this show called Sunny. Have either of you guys heard of it? Sunny? No. I feel like no one's heard of it. No. Like I've, I see no discussion of it, no 
discourse. I mean, I stumbled on it kind of randomly, but it's the only thing that I'm really into on television right now. Synopsis, please. So it's um, a kind of slightly comedic mystery starring Rashida Jones, you know, Rashida Jones from... um, Parks and Rec. From Parks and Rec and from The Office. And she is an expat living in a slightly futuristic Kyoto whose husband and son either die or go missing. It's not entirely clear Mm -hmm. in a plane crash. And her husband, who worked in robotics, leaves her this kind of home helper robot that he has clearly (laughs) programmed in some unusual way, the significance of which is mysterious. And she gets mixed up with the Yakuza, and there's some kind of code that people are searching for that can make these robots, which are kind of ubiquitous, do things that ordinarily robots should not be permitted to do. (laughs) And in some ways, it reminds me of Severance. You know, it has this slightly surreal deadpan quality to it. It's short. I think most episodes are roughly a half hour. And it's the only thing that's on TV right now that I'm really like, oh, is there a new episode out yet? Okay, okay. This goes on my summer watch list. I've run out of things. I'm waiting for, like, the new season of Shrinking to come back in a couple months. But until then, this is it. I'm going there. Yeah, we need we need Japanese content at the moment, <laughs> I think. Both, both I was because, not expecting that, Ross. Well, both because... The weakness of the yen against the dollar explains why basically everyone I know has been going to Japan. Oh, yeah, that's true. I feel like I've I've known, ton, including my mother-in-law, who is embarking on a trip to Japan this spring. And all of this is making my eight-year-old son, who is sort of obsessed with samurai, really angry because he wants to go to Japan. And I've tried to explain to him that we can't take five kids, including a newborn, on a trans-Pacific flight. It's funny. My son also badly wants to go to Japan, and we're going to hopefully do it for his 13th birthday. That's so funny. My 19-year-old is obsessed with anime, like complete anime nut, and wants to go to Japan. I mean, my son studies Japanese on wow. Duolingo. Oh, wow. Nice. How old is your son now? 11. 11. Well, maybe he can take my son who is eight and will be <laughs> will be 10, to Japan. It's a very safe country, so they could just go together. But it doesn't seem very safe in this show. What? Well, that's <laughs> Yakuza Shmakuza. That's what I always say. All right. Fantastic. I'm going to go book our group trip to Japan now. But before that, I just want to say how great it was to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me and Ross. Thank you, Michelle. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining our conversation today. Give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. And if you're so moved, leave us a nice review to let other people know why they should listen. We love hearing your questions and ideas for future conversations. So if you have one, share it with us in a voicemail by calling 212-556-7440. You can also email us at matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion is produced by Phoebe Lett, Sofia Alvarez-Board, and Andrea Batanzos. It's edited by Jordana Hochman. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Afim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Pat McCusker. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. 